Welcome to the Lean to the Left podcast, where we focus on progressive politics and the important social issues of our time, with just a little lean to the left. Now, today we welcome Matthew Stevenson. Matthew is author of many books, including his latest, Donald Trump's Circus Maximus and Joe Biden's Excellent Adventure. And it's about the 2016 and 2020 elections. And I just love that title. He joins us from his home in Switzerland. During the 2016 and 2020 U.S. presidential elections, Stevenson followed the many Republican and Democratic candidates in primary states, at political conventions, and in various debates, coming away with firsthand impressions of those who would be president, including Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. He traveled across New Hampshire and Iowa, heard candidates in New York, Washington, D.C., and Chicago, and attended numerous political rallies. The result is a political book that's a delight for the firsthand accounts of the candidates, for the rich humor and the language and the insights into a system that's closer to carnival barking than Athenian democracy. We're pleased to have Matthew with us on the Lean to the Left podcast. But first, I need to urge you guys to visit podcast.leantotheleft.net, where you'll find thumbnails and links to all of our episodes. You can subscribe there, too, and don't forget to give us a rating wherever you listen. Five stars would be super-duper cool. Now, Matthew, sorry for the commercial, but I do thank you for joining us on the Lean to the Left podcast. Thank you, Bob, for having me, and thank you for giving me the chance to meet, however indirectly, some of your listeners. I know they're loyal to you and they're loyal to your program. I appreciate that very much. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to write more than a dozen books and many articles for national publications? Let me start with my background in politics, since this is a more of a political show and a political interview. Okay. I was born and grew up in and around New York City. My mother was a social worker. My father was a World War II veteran. Both of them grew up in and around New York. And at age six, my mother put me on her shoulders and held me aloft while then-Senator, soon-to-be President John F. Kennedy, spoke in a parking lot on Long Island. So politics was part of my upbringing. Okay. In the eighth grade, no, it was about no close to seventh grade, seventh or eighth grade, she took me to another political meeting in which I met Senator Robert F. Kennedy, then Senator from New York. So politics was part of our background, part of my life. And in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I went to college in the U.S. and graduate school in New York at Columbia in international affairs, which is political science, really. Mm -hmm. And from that, I, I got a job at Harper's Magazine in the late 70s, early 80s, when Lewis Lapham was the editor of Harper's. And that began my writing career more i was more of an editor than a writer there and since then just by keeping one page into the it used to be a typewriter now it's a word processor computer Mm -hmm. i've written books about i would say books that interest me so yes i've written about french history chinese history essays about american politics and this book following the candidates around 2016 2020, I confess, was a labor of love. What do you mean by that? I'm drawn to the political world, take offense at, as you say, carnival barking. I see it as a pattern of American history that we've had really since Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and the early barkers. And it, while I know the, the trend is to say this is we've never had it so bad in American politics, Yes, I, I get. I take the point. At the same time, what I find interesting about American politics is it's a recurring theme. It, it does rhyme, as Mark Twain would say. And so what I love about American history, Lincoln, Jefferson, the Roosevelts, whomever it is, I love seeing in this current era some of the same patterns, for better or for worse. And I guess we can We'll get on to the worst parts of it, but there are some better parts, too. Okay. How about giving us a quick synopsis of Donald Trump's Circus Maximus and Joe Biden's 
excellent adventure. What's it all about? What's the point of it? Let's start with Trump, since he's okay. the sort of the the the, uh, the current. And let me take you and your listeners to a Trump rally. Maybe some have been to a Trump rally. Maybe very few have been to a Trump rally. The only thing it's akin to, in my experience, is professional wrestling. Imagine a hall of about 8,000, 10,000 people, an armory in Pittsburgh, a college auditorium in Iowa, whatever it is. There's mm-hmm. nothing about it that's intellectual. There's no political tradition. It's a circus event in the purest form. Trump is not in politics to inform, to enlighten, to articulate views. Trump is in politics pretty much as a kind of a sideshow to make money or to stay out of jail, whichever it is. And they come through in these rallies in a exaggerated sense. I don't know if you've been to an NBA game, Bob, at all, (laughs) but they shoot T-shirts into the audience at halftime and during some of the quarters, which is what it is. And at Trump rallies, they do the same thing. So it's a sporting event. It's not a political event. Trump doesn't come at politics, say, the way Lincoln came at it. Lincoln ran for office in 1860 because he hated slavery and he hated the extension of slavery into the new territories of the United States. Trump comes at politics as a kind of an immunity plea. Mm -hmm. So that would be how I would describe Trump. Biden, it's a different tradition, different person, different animal, I would say. And with all these candidates in in 2016 and 2020, I did my best to see them three or four times. So if I saw somebody on a bad day, I didn't want to judge them harshly or judge them favorably just based on one appearance. Biden, I would say Biden has a, has an affection for the American people. I think that you see it in his events. He, they tended to be small, smaller than he would have wanted. When Trump was getting 8,000 and Iowa, Biden was getting 200 and never really caught fire in, a, in an electoral sense. But Biden has a visceral, I would say, like for American politics, American voters, which doesn't come through in his presidency, I I don't think. In his presidency, he strikes me as a little more distant, a little more detached. But in a if you go to a rally in a firehouse in Iowa, the Biden is somebody who has an affinity for labor unions and for having he's run so many times, he knows these people by heart. His events Although the the sad part of Biden's events is Biden didn't really win in an electoral sense in 2020. He was anointed by the Democratic powers. Mm -hmm. They've done it before. They did it all through 200 years of, of American democracy. So that the Biden never really had that barn burning capacity that other candidates, say John F. Kennedy, brought to a campaign. Okay. Now, what are your thoughts about the about Trump's impeachment trials and the refusal of the Senate to convict him after the January 6th insurrection? I think that it was a lost opportunity for Democrats and for Republicans. I would say more for Republicans than for Democrats. I thought that it was a not to be overly sentimental about it. I thought the impeachment was necessary and proper, to quote from another document that it refers to. Mm -hmm. And I thought I think that had the Republicans taken a step back and seen that we could be done with our Trump era and move on, an impeachment after January 6th was correct. There's no doubt we all have a television screen. We all have a computer to watch on. There's no question that was insurrection. We have no question that it was inciting a riot. We have no Mm -hmm. question that it was at a moment. There have been other demonstrations that are not at the moment when they're counting the electoral votes, and that was one. So I don't think that from a justice standpoint, they well, McConnell Pat was, he, he, he kicked the can down the, the street. And I think that was for the Republicans. I think it'll come back to haunt them. For the Democrats, I think the Democrats did right by that impeachment. I don't know if you watched it. I think I watched all of it as I, yeah, one I of the advantages of living here and yeah. time difference and whatnot. I just couldn't get enough of it, like mm-hmm. almost the Watergate hearings of an earlier era. 
and the people on those committees, the Jamie Raskin, Schiff before that, they strike me as conscientious, professional politicians in the best sense of the word. I think we as a country, the United States, missed a moment that could have been, it could have taken advantage of something that needs to be done. There's no, and we're paying for it now. There's the spectacle of having a campaign or in between criminal trials is, sorry to say it, it's obscene. It is obscene. It's incredible that we have a former president who is now in court charged with crimes, a number of crimes. And he's still running. He's still running for the presidency. And the Republicans are, are ready to anoint him. And it's just incredible to me. But who do you think really lost when they refused to convict him in the impeachment trial? I think who lost was the American sense of democracy. I think that the Constitution, which is, let's be fair, it's 5,000 words. It's not 50,000 words. Any of your listeners who wants to reacquaint themselves with the Constitution probably do it in about 35 minutes of just sitting down and reading it at the kitchen table. And the Constitution's very clear that the, I always thought it was took some pleasure that in drafting the Constitution, one of the questions was this, Bob, the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia debated for a long time whether when the president entered the room, the members of the Congress would stand up, mm -hmm. meaning he was subservient to the expressions of the House of Representatives. It was not a it was not a monarchy. It wasn't, there was no ha playing of hail to the chief in 1789. And so what was lost when we, when a Trump wasn't impeached was this sense that, that the house in this kind of house of representatives, the expression of the American people was ignored. We, there's no doubt that the majority of house members you know, the, the, and their constituents thought he was guilty. We all, it was not, it was clear so in that sense, what was lost for listeners, you have younger listeners, not just guys my age. And I think that they're, they're thinking what happens to the democracy as I get older. And the hope is it perseveres. But if you're not going to convict Trump in, after January 6th, you're really not a functioning democracy. Yeah. Okay. Now that Trump's court cases are moving forward, what do you think is going to happen to the guy? And apparently he's having a hard time staying awake in this Stormy Daniels hush money trial, which <laughs> cracks me up. How in the hell can he doze off when so much is at stake for him? I just don't get that. I, I think that what I think the only thing that that matters to Trump in this in the in these trials is trying to somehow jury rig them or flip them, however you want to use whichever verb you're searching for, uh -huh. and have them somehow be a fundraising moment. I don't think he I don't I think most people have a sense of guilt or shame if they were on trial for so many criminal charges, 91 and all. They they would feel some kind of remorse. But Trump is a sociopath at many levels. He doesn't feel any remorse, doesn't feel that he's ever done anything wrong in his life, be it leveraging his father's wealth into kind of more bankruptcies or abusing women or abusing the, the Constitution. No remorse. Yeah. So that he doze off to me is he's been dozing off as an adult since he was 21 years old. But I think that the, the election that we've got going in 2024, people need to pay attention. It's an important, these are important moments. And you can, as Yogi Berra said, you can observe a lot by watching. The Supreme Court appears poised to reject Trump's claim that he's immune from prosecution on charges of trying to subvert the 2020 election. What are your thoughts about that? I find this Supreme Court a kind of personal injury law firm for in-house counsel for Donald Trump. I don't really <laughs> think that the Supreme Court, in, in this case, is any kind of executive third branch of government. Yeah. If you ride the subways in New York, you look up over the strap hangers and you'll see the 1-800 numbers is, have you been injured? And that's pretty much the 
Roberts Court. I think that the Supreme Court is a is not a representative of anything other than maybe Trump's kind of interests at heart. I think yes. I think that how I listened to the debates as best I could, the streaming of it. I think that what they will do, they'll send it back, remand it, however that verb is, to the district court, Judge Tanya Chutkin, and try to qualify as best they can what is a presidential act and what isn't, meaning is it if you do something in an official capacity or don't. The only reason to do that is that it will push it past the November election, and they'll their hope, or at least six of six of nine hope that he's reelected and that he'll then dismiss his own charges. That's their only, this is a kind of, in the National Hockey League, this is called icing the puck, is all mm-hmm. they're doing. They're not serious legal scholars. Clarence Thomas, if he was an honest person, if he was a, a, any kind of a justice, would recuse himself, he, which he didn't right. do. That's, so what are we supposed to conclude? Are we supposed to conclude that somehow... This is an expression of some American will. No, it's it's an expression of six kind of hired hands of the Trump organization. Yeah, that's really incredible. He managed to stack the Supreme Court in his favor. I don't know whether he realized he was going to need their help or not, but it certainly proved to be the case. And I just think it's it's an incredible thing that we have a Supreme Court that is no longer really functioning as it should as a Supreme Court of the United States, in my opinion. Now, what do you think about Trump's been charged with? He's got a ton of money that he's got to pay, hundreds of millions of dollars that he's got to pay. Now, he's selling golden high tops that are made in China and mega Bibles. <laughs> to help cover his costs that he's incurring in those cases. What do you think about all of that, Matthew? I think that, and you could add Trump media, his his, his Wall Street <laughs> yeah, yeah. dump and pump and dump, as they say on Wall Street. <laughs> Look, I think that the, I've been of the view that in 2016, he wasn't running for president. He was running away from his creditors. I don't believe any of the hype that he's a millionaire, billionaire. Trump is one of those people who basically defines his net worth as what he can borrow, not what he has. Yeah. He's borrowed a million dollars. He's worth a million. It's he's worth a million dollars. And I think that the the you're seeing this. He couldn't post a, a serious bond in that in New York State course for Tish James. He couldn't, he hasn't paid E. Jean Carroll. And he's now running what like a, a Ponzi scheme on Wall Street with Trump media. So mm-hmm. all in all, it says to me that seven hundred and fifty dollar taxpayer Donald J. Trump is the the wolf is at the door, and all he's really doing is playing a kind of a three card Monty hand around various assets that he has, mm-hmm. hoping that people will overlook that he's not a billionaire. But I think at some point. Bob, let's hope that the debts come due. And if you, if they can't pay them, they sell assets. I don't yeah. think he, I don't, I don't think... really, I don't believe, I'm sorry, I could give you the accounting side of it, but I don't think anybody really wants to hear it. But Trump Media, there's the basic numbers, had revenue of $4 million, $4 million of revenue and right. a loss of $58 million, and somehow Wall Street values the company at $4 billion. It's a, it's an illusion. It's a dream. It's not. It's no more than Charles Ponzi is going to give you back your deposit. <laughs> okay. In, in the closing chapter of your book, you say that Trump is guilty and Biden should resign. How about explaining all that for me? When I wrote it, this is this is about a year ago when that was that chapter was written. Uh-huh. And for your listeners, again, the the book is it's on Amazon. It, you find Matthew Mills Stevenson might get you closer than just Matthew Stevenson mm-hmm. and Trump and Biden. What I was what I meant by that, Bob, and I don't what I thought Biden had done well in his first two three years. I think eighty is a limit of some kind for presidential age requirement, whatever you want to say. And I thought what he should have done 
is say, I've done my best. I'm going to, this is what the chapter says. He resigns as president at noon on whatever day. And Kamala Harris becomes president with the proviso that she submit to an open primary of the Democratic Party. At the same time, he says, if it's the expression of the Senate, he agrees to serve as vice president. So in effect, they'd swap jobs. Okay. In corporate America, we've all had jobs in various organizations. People swap jobs. Think of the young moms who say, wait, I've had a baby. I need to swap job with a friend of mine. So Harris would have had a year to prove herself good or ill. Uh, we yeah. may, oh, I don't know if she's capable executive or not. Mm -hmm. Hard to judge. She would have had a year to prove herself, stand in the primaries, go up against Newsom, go up against Gretchen Whitmer, whoever else is out there, Adam Schiff. You pick your candidates, have a real primary, have a Democratic vote, and, and come into 2024 with a younger candidate. It's not a, it's not a particularly an anti-Biden to say that 82 is a, just a little long in the tooth to, to run a big country. He's 81 right now, and <laughs> four more years, if he should win, what, he's going to be 86 by the time he's done. That is a little long in the tooth. It really is. And I, I, and I think that, that that was the point of it was just to say, I don't, look, age limits are not particularly, but what job... What jobs in the United States would hire someone at 81 to do it? You wouldn't be a principal of a public school. You wouldn't be the manager of a Walmart. You wouldn't be most things. And I don't know why then we have to waive it and say we want a president. For this reason, I, 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 don't, I don't, you might have to get on a plane and fly to Guam and have a meeting or fly to Sydney, Australia. And 80 year old guys on airplanes for 16 hours it's it's not it's it's not a recipe for the ura game no, and i don't not. say is maybe you get something wisdom judgment okay let's hope yeah. but i don't think we've all had 86 year old men and women in our lives and they're not the person you'd put in the top job yeah okay so what's trump done to the republican party do you think with all well, I think, the, I think the Republican Party's finished as a political party. I think you can say it came to life in, what, 1856 with John C. Fremont was the probably their first candidate, or Abraham Lincoln is their first president. And I think 2024 will probably be the, maybe it will still be called the Republican Party. I don't, I think he's eviscerated it. I think the people who had, the Republicans that, you and I knew growing up who had some ideals who were not, they might have thought government should be smaller. They might have thought that Russia needed to be watched. Whatever the values of that, that's gone. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. I think this Republican Party is a, we've used the, we all use the phrase, a cult. It's the cult of Trump. And that isn't a party. That's just a kind of a gang or a kind of a racket. It's not a, it doesn't believe in any. What is it to support Vladimir Putin in Ukraine? Is it doesn't express any ideals of Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt or Robert Taft, or you name the Republican that you might have admired. And so I think that the, I don't see... I said, look, he can, Trump could probably win. I don't, Biden may slip and fall. Trump may get some second win. It, my gut, my gut instinct says he's finished it off. Trump's finished. Is that what I think, I think the Republican party under the Trumpism, that the Republican party as an expression of Donald Trump mm -hmm. is a recipe for nothing other than self aggrandizement and kind of opportunism. It's not a, to be a political party, even in a country like the United States, which only has two parties, European countries have 15 or 20, mm -hmm. have to stand for something that, that is an, a, will attract a majority. And I don't see it in Trump. I don't see anything other than his hand in, on your wallet. Yeah, for sure. Now, Biden, Biden's uh, poll numbers uh, seem to be improving at this moment against Trump. So what are your actual expectations for the election, do you think? 
boy, I, you, you'll have me on in a, well, I hope you have me on in a year, Bob, and you can say, okay. boy, I wish we, I wish you'd knew a little more about politics than we thought you did because <laughs> of your vote. I think that, I think most people early, seven or eight months prior to election, they, they say things like, I'm not voting for Biden. I hate Gaza. I hate this, or I'm not right. voting for Trump. I hate right. abortion, whatever it is. Right. As the polls are, I don't think polls are particularly accurate anymore just because nobody has a landline and nobody answers their cell phone. So I think that as we get closer to the election, I think you'll get a kind of reversion to political norms. I think that there's a slight Democratic majority in the United States, meaning generic Democrats over generic Republicans. I think that will come out. I can't promise you that Biden does well in every swing state, Wisconsin. I think he wins Pennsylvania, though. Mm -hmm. I think he wins Arizona. I think some of these states that he needs to win, I think he will. I think if he just keeps doing what he's doing as best he can, provided he doesn't literally have a fall, that would be a bad thing in this thing. And Trump keeps doing what he's doing, which is to stand as a criminal defendant on his 91 indictments. I would hope and I would if I had to bet today, I would bet on a on a narrow, I bet on this, I bet Biden wins, I think the Democrats win the House, I think the Republicans win the Senate. And you can open this file a year from now and say, boy, it's tell you, that's the last time we're having a guy in Switzerland tell us who was going to win an election. Oh, I don't know about that, Matthew. I, I tend to agree with your analysis, actually. Matter of fact, I think it's right on. I really do. Now, however, if Trump should win, what do you think the consequences would be for this country? I'll give you I'll give you the dark answer and the light answer. Let's start with the dark, which is what's on most of our minds. The dark answer is democracy doesn't survive another four years of Donald Trump packs the court some more. We, for all you know, he arrests people like Adam Schiff or his Jamie Raskin, people, his perceived enemies. Trump is, the, the the word fascist applies. It may be neo-fascist in the sense that it's he doesn't really believe as in state enterprises. He believes in pers- business. The government is an expression of the Trump brand. Mm-hmm. I don't see how you put somebody with who abuses women, abuses the constitution, violates the kind of the electoral college vote, and somehow he becomes the symbol of democracy. I don't see it. I don't see how that lasts. Mm -hmm. So in the dark sense, the dark night of the soul, I think that we, it's the Sinclair Lewis novel in 1936 published under the title, it can't happen. He, it it can happen here and that's that that's so that's the dark side i'll give you the light side bob since you asked for it mm-hmm. which is the united states despite having trump on the ballot despite his many crimes and misdemeanors it's bigger than one guy it's even bigger than a kind of a guy with his ego and you spend the 4 years just enduring it and after four more years of Trump, if that if it came to it, I don't think you'd see a Republican in the White House for 40 years. I think that it would just be such a traumatic effect that, that the idea being that the government would be run by an outlaw. Those are the two sides of it. Maybe both of them could be considered dark, but you asked me for what I thought, and I'm trying to oblige. Yeah. You're saying that you think that that the Republicans are done. Just, I think as a, I think it may there may be another party, the American Independent Party. I don't know. You name the, you'll come up with a name. I just mm-hmm. don't know what's happened to all those Republicans that I knew growing up in New York who were Javits Republicans. They were decent people. They had their views. Yeah. Uh, they kind of living under the sofa. Where, where are? What happened? To, and is it all this kind of? Trump cult guys who love guns and whatever else, Putin, yeah. you name it. I don't know. I don't see that. I don't see how you get 51% of the country embracing that, those views. This maybe sounds a little bit superficial, but when Reagan was president, 
and when other Republicans were president, there was always there was always criticism of the Soviets, of Russia, of communism, of dictatorships. And now it seems like they're embracing all of that. And it just is incredible to me. If the con I find it incredible too, when you think about it. Ukraine from where I'm sitting is about three hours to three and a half hours to the east of here. It's not very mm -hmm. far. Mm -hmm. And it, there's no question when you line up your army with tanks and invade a neighboring country, it's an act of war. Yeah. And that the Republican Party could find in Putin somehow a, a, a messiah, a savior, a kind of a, a, a load. I see it in this way, Bob, and I may be completely off base and you're, you could tell me. I think there, I think the, that Putin somehow, as does Trump, somehow speaks for kind of the resurgimento of white Christian men. And I don't think he does, because I don't think there's anything Christian in, in Trump's values. But let's just take it as a symbolic thing. Mm -hmm. And the embrace of Putin is somehow wrapped up in a slightly fundamentalist view of what has happened, that the United States is more multicultural. And I think that maybe explains some of the Putin affection, but I don't think it's warranted. And I don't think that it's, I think it's a travesty when you look at, you know, look at the, look at Kennedy's kind of 1960 or pick Jimmy Carter in 1980 with the invasion of Afghanistan. You know, they, they took a principled view of the Soviet Union as an encroaching power that was run by its own mob, KGB or whomever, Politburo. Mm -hmm. And it was nothing admirable. I've been to Russia many times, and I think the Russian history and Russian literature has is great. I think Russian politics is, a, is gangland. And why would the Republican Party hitch its star to such a crowd? I, it's hard for me to imagine. It's hard for me to imagine that, too, and I just... It's just impossible, really. All right. So where can people find your book, Matthew, and, and how can they reach out to you? Okay. The, the, you, you gave the title, Donald yeah. Trump's uh, Circus Maximus and Joe Biden's Excellent Adventure. The simplest way is just to go Matthew Mills Stevenson or Matthew Stevenson at Amazon. Other books, the earlier books that I've written are all there as well on, on the author okay. page. Just about every book of mine, I'm pretty sure, has my email on the back jacket or the inside flap. And if they okay. want to get in touch, write me an email. I'll, I'll write you back or okay. give me a call. I'm not. I take pleasure in communicating and speaking with people like yourself, Bob, and readers of my books, because I feel that when you write a book, you're starting a conversation. And if someone wants to continue it, I try to do the best I can. Sometimes it doesn't always work out, but most of the time. You've experienced. It's a it's a pleasure for me, and I hope a pleasure for the readers. And then there's tend to write a lot about the election for Counterpunch, which is the online magazine. Mm -hmm. They those tend to come out on Fridays. They're not all collected into some of the books. A few of them are, but they're. I've been doing pretty much a weekly column of a couple of thousand words on on what we you and I've been discussing. So. Okay. That's another place to to find them, and okay. I hope it. I hope your listeners and my readers become the same ones. Yeah, that would be great. All right, listen. I thank you so much for being with us on our podcast. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Matthew? No, I just think Bob. I just want to thank you for doing what you do because without podcasts like yours, ideas. You're willing to listen to ideas that the I don't think every mainstream media outlet is willing to entertain. You're willing to take it. You're willing to take intellectual curiosity to the level where it should be, which is to pose cat questions to writers, politicians, and let your listeners have their own answers that they don't have to agree with you and me. Yep. You and I can start them on their their way. But I I applaud people like yourself for having a voice because at the end of the day your podcast is what stands between the United States and a kind of a darker future so let's hope that as Lincoln said the better angels of our nature and your podcast uh, come out on top 
Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Hey, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and you found it interesting and informative. Please visit on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that focus on progressive politics and the important social issues of our time. Now, our interview shows stream on Mondays with special episodes on Thursdays. And you can check out upcoming shows, guests, and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net. Subscribe to our audio version there and to our video shows here at YouTube. And follow us on social media, Facebook at Bob Gaddy and the Lean to the Left podcast. Now, it's two. Bob Gaddy is one Facebook page, and the Lean to the Left podcast is a second Facebook page. Twitter at Lean to the Left one. Instagram at Lean to the Left one. TikTok at Lean to the Left. LinkedIn at Bob Gaddy. And YouTube at Lean to the Left. Now, I hope you'll support Lean to the Left as well so we can keep things going. Just click on the Donate tab at the top of the LeanToTheLeft.net homepage and contribute by buying me a cup of coffee. That'll really help and would be much, much, much appreciated. Now, this is Bob Gaddy signing off for Lean to the Left. Thanks for sharing your time with us.